Welcome to our very first panel here at the Bytons booth of three that we're going to be having in the next three days. Welcome to TechCrunch Disrupt 2018. Um, I hope everyone's got enough coffee flowing through their bloodstreams right now. And um, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm really excited about this panel, guys. And first of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Alex Guberman. I'm the creator and a host of a YouTube channel called E4 Electric, where we talk about electric cars every day about the amazing universe of electric cars. And that's why I'm excited to be here. One of the reasons is because we're at the Bytons booth, uh, one of the most exciting new brands that are coming out on the market this year. Um, if you haven't seen this amazing prototype behind us, definitely give it, give it, give it a look uh, inside, and you'll, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, the second reason I'm excited, we're going to be talking about the user experience in, uh, in cars. And I think, I think everybody can relate to that. Uh, we are definitely have been all kind of victims of bad user experience in cars if we ever had the um, had to had my uh, our, our windshield wipers turned on by accident we know we, we know what it's like but most importantly I'm excited to have this gentleman to the left of me sitting here and, and, and we're gonna have a great discussion about user experience um, I'm gonna let them introduce themselves and we're gonna start with uh, John uh, hi and welcome my name is John Scumutalis I'm head of products for Alexa Automotive um, I, too, am caffeinated this morning as well. Came Excellent. down from Seattle last <laughs> night. I've uh, been in technology for 30-plus years. I've uh, been with Amazon for the last two years, uh, taking our Alexa technology and uh, adapting it and evolving it for uh, in-vehicle experiences. Uh, we've been partnered with uh, Byton for a couple years now to bring uh, Alexa into their vehicles. Super excited to be here. Looking forward to this panel. Hey, everyone. My name is Hauke Schmidt. I'm with um, Bosch. We have a research uh, and development center down in uh, South Valley in Sunnyvale. Um, I've been heading that since um, two years now, and um, I have a background in a lot of research in AI, robotics, STEM, auto automated driving, and so on. And I'm really excited on, about the opportunity here to discuss um, the, the, the great car that we see behind us. There's also a good collaboration between Bosch and Byton going on, so this is a really exciting time for us. Thank you. All right, Jeff. Hi, I'm Jeff Chung, a Vice President of Intelligent Car Experience uh, at Byton. Um, my team basically does all the in-car experience. So if you're sitting in the car, you have big displays, um, any interactive devices, the typical HMI, HMI um, hardware, software, UI, UX design, um, you know, that's under our team. And you know, very excited to be here. Um, again, you know, we're great partnerships with Amazon and Bosch, and also, um, Lots to learn from, from Jay over here, from uh, you know, ex, uh, Tesla as well. So very excited to be here. I think we'll have a great panel. Thank you. Jay, uh, Jay Vijan, founder and CEO of Techion Corp. Um, we are developing a cloud platform um, transforming the automotive retail. Um, I'll give a bit more detail as we get into this session. So prior to um, starting Techion, I was the CIO of Tesla. So I had a phenomenal opportunity to build pretty much most of the backbone um, software and platform um, for, uh, for Tesla. All right, well, so let's, let's jump right in. And my first question is for Jeff, but feel free to jump in because I think everybody can relate to this. Um, you know, we have such a high demand now and high requirement for having a good user experience with our gadgets, right? Our cell phones, our, our, our laptops, tablets, even refrigerators and microwaves, right? We get really annoyed if we have to make an extra click or whatever. But somehow, we have a very low standard and very low demand for a great user experience in cars, something that we spend so much money on, so much time in, and yet it is pretty overall very minimal right now what we kind of demand from our cars. Why is that, and do you feel like this is the time to change that? So it's a great question. Um, I think absolutely this is the right time. Um, we're in, in the automotive industry, we're at this tipping point in terms of technology. As we get more ADAS or autonomous driving capabilities, it allows the user to get more of their time back. And that's what we're all about is how do we provide the best experience? And so when you have that time back, you know, it's what are you going to do with it, right? You can obviously in a driver mode, you can absolutely drive the car. But if you want, and most people do, is they want content. They want um, connectivity, accessibility that you typically see, you know, you have in your cell phones. And so we want to give that experience 
as part of the in-car experience. So you, you actually don't have to take out your phone. If you want a great map experience, we'll have a great navigation screen that takes up you know, a good two-thirds of our large screen. And you know, if you want content, whether it's streaming content, whether it's you know, Amazon content, um, you'll have all that. Um, and we have to do it in a way that it is not disruptive or distracting to the driver in those scenarios. So it's this interesting you know, balance between providing content, but also keeping the, the driver and the occupant safe. I mean, I, I totally agree. I mean, I, ca I can't wait for this whole thing to get rolling, and I think you guys have a pretty good start, but uh, essentially, do you think the users, the audience that we create our products for is, is ready for it? Do you think there's a demand? Um, so far, the feedback has been very, very positive. I, th I think there will be a demand because, you know, a good analogy is Tesla revolutionized the EV industry, right? They really pushed it forward. What we're trying to do is not really disrupt EV, but disrupt the user experience industry for automotive. And then I do think, you know, from the feedback we've received, you know, the, the customer base is ready for a change. Uh, so, yeah, go ahead, Hulk. Yeah, I think you, you, you were asking why now, right? So I think um, in, the, in the past, what you saw, there was an entertainment system or infotainment system that catered to the driver and passenger likewise, right? And we now have technology coming in that allows us to actually recognize who is uh, going to consume what part of the uh, content. And of course, the uh, content will be very different that we display to passengers than to the driver because there's the distraction issue to take care of, of course. You don't want to overload the driver of a car too much um, and, and uh, reduce safety that way, right? So we now have that technology. I think that is one of the main driving factors, plus, of course, the connectivity that, that is ubiquitous nowadays. Right? So you're saying the demand was there all along. It's the technology finally catching up to the yeah. demand. Is that what you're yeah. suggesting? Okay. Now, one of the UX technology that's kind of snuck up on us, if you will, uh, lately is the interaction with our voices, right? We don't have to press anything or click anything. We can literally just ask and get the response back. And John, obviously that uh, question is for you. Uh, do you th why do you think we're all of a sudden ready for that type of user experience? And you know, you're, you're working on a, a Alexa Auto. Uh, tell us how that experience is going to be different from what we're used to in our living rooms already. Right. Uh, I, I think uh, we're, uh, I agree with my fellow panelists here. There's, we're at the kind of confluence of a lot of disruptive changes that are occurring in the automotive industry. If you look at electrification, connectivity, um, these are uh, enabling the automobile as kind of a new software platform for us. Um, especially with connectivity where we can rely on our cloud services to really provide an in-car voice recognition system that goes far beyond kind of the traditional grammar-based, menu-based systems that we've seen in the past. Uh, with Amazon Alexa and our Echo devices, uh, customers have grown to really love the experience in the home where you can interact with Alexa in a very natural way. We want to bring that same experience now into the car. Um, so if I'm uh, interacting with my digital ecosystem, whether it's music, news, entertainment, I move into my vehicle, I have access to that uh, automatically from within the vehicle. I can resume reading a book. I can resume my music experience. I, we provide a uh, a seamless mobility experience with Alexa as we move from the home to the car. So you're saying this is really not going to be a, a, a different experience, this is going to be a kind of a continuous experience as I walk to my car from my living room. C certainly we provide that continuity, that mobility experience that moves with you from the home in between and into the car. Uh, and in the car, it'll be a much more natural way that you'll be able to interact with the vehicle as well, where you're not going to have to memorize a menu or a grammar. You just tell the car what you want. Uh, you tell your vehicle you're cold, it'll automatically increase the temperature in the vehicle. Or the vehicle will know when you're approaching the home and automatically start interacting with your smart home devices as well to prepare your home. And, and you bring up an interesting point because uh, uh, with a traditional, if you will, user interface, we are kind of limited to what uh, it has to offer us as far as the preset menus, preset graphics and everything. With the interaction nowadays and especially with voice commands, and you guys feel free to jump in and let me know your, your opinion on this as well, but uh, you know, this now are self-learning uh, user experience devices. Tell me a little bit about how like, uh, Alex, in this case, uh, learns what I'm about, Alex, and my interaction with my car, um, and kind of enhances my experience with that. Yeah. 
Well, when you're interacting with the Alexa uh, services, we know the services that you're frequenting. We know what you'd like to do with Alexa. So we start to personalize that experience for you. Uh, you combine that with uh, geolocation and spatial information about where you're at in the vehicle, then we can start to recognize those patterns that go beyond the home into the vehicle. Um, yeah, Alexa is a cloud service, so she's always uh, adapting, always learning, always getting smarter. Uh, so we bring all that information in to provide you uh, a personalized experience in the vehicle. Yeah, you know, um, I, I, I my, my first experience with, with a, a, a car that was learning what I'm doing was uh, when I got my 2012 Tesla. And Jay, obviously, you know, you're a part of, a part of Tesla's team. Yep. Um, tell me a little bit about what have you learned, what Tesla has really yep. A learn and brought to our user experience that's different sure. than what we've had before. Because I mean, I can argue that like much with an iPhone, right? Yeah. Uh, it wasn't just <clears throat> just about the technology the device, right? It's about how easy it was and yeah. exciting it was to use the iPhone. And I felt like Tesla was what it was for me and many other people. Right. Talk a little bit more about that. What are the things that they re you know, kind of did different and yeah. better than everybody else before them. Uh, yeah, a great, great question. I think fundamentally that was the biggest difference where Tesla had an opportunity to build ground up what customers would want. Similar, similar to how um, Apple did with iPhone in terms of the experience. I think a few important things I want to touch. One is the front end, the interface, what the customer interacts. I mean, everything comes into picture, voice recognition, um, everything that a customer would need available for them right away. And then their experience kind of shifts. The car, the in-car experience becomes an extension of what they do. The most important thing that I think Tesla did right is building the ecosystem around it. Really the infrastructure to support and scale it so that when a customer interacts not only with the car, but outside the car as well, when they interact with the company, anything to do with Tesla, the experience really carries forward seamlessly. I think that was the fundamental difference how they built ground up uh, EV and also a uh, user experience that is state of the art, really a leapfrog from how things were because traditionally over time, it has been only incremental changes as all of us know. I think with Tesla coming in now, we have a lot of innovative companies coming in and trying to revolutionize uh, bringing all these things together. The experience itself as you know, um, iPhone leveled up um, the phone experience, what the phone could be. Uh, Alexa leveled up the voice recognition experience. There are different tools. I think the next generation of automobile is going to be, how are you bring, going to bring all of those? So your um, life experience in your uh, house or your experience in your office and an experience in your car, how does that all come together seamlessly? I think that's what I think is going to be the future compared to what how things were in the past. Yeah. And, and what I think what you guys keep keep mentioning a few times now, safety, right? We, we always think of safety, at least that's the old school of thinking, is that, well, what happens if I, I'm in an accident, right? How many airbags are going to protect me? What happens with the crumble zones and all that stuff? But essentially, I think, what, as people are learning, is that's actually how do we prevent that in the first place, right? And user experience is a big part of it. So, uh, and Holger, this is really a question for you uh, at first is, you know, Bosch has been very much on the front lines providing a lot of different safety features from different manufacturers. Um, do you think that this whole revolution of user experience on cars going to uh, help it or hurt it? Because on one hand, there's so many features we now have, you know, I feel like, you know, my, my attention to the road might decrease. On another hand, like much like with, uh, you know, Alexa interaction, I may not have to take my eyes off the road if I'm interacting with a car with a voice. Do you think this is a, a blessing in disguise or do you think this is going to be a problem? No, so first of all, I think we live in extremely exciting times, right? The last five years, the next 10 years will be so hugely disruptive and it's just an exciting thing to be part of that. And so Bosch has also been at the forefront of shaping this transition in mobility as that, that we're seeing happening. And I completely agree with Jay. It goes beyond just sort of the in-car experience. It ties together also how this works with the home. It ties together your workplace. But it goes beyond that as well in terms of um, sort of behind the scenes improvement that we see, like uh, being able to use the field data that the cars now transmit to the cloud that, that allows us to see how cars are actually being used 
versus what the engineers' view of that was uh, in previous years, right? So, and that allows us, again, to offer new features and, and, and improve the experience. Um, to your point on safety, um, I think the, um, the, the main point is um, there's driver distraction, so you have the issue of, of being safe in traffic. There's also the issue of <coughs> um, sort of the, the innovation speed that software was allowing over the last decade in, um, in, in the internet space and then social media space, where it seems to me the mode of operation has been let's, let's sort of do a minimal product that we can imagine providing a value, roll it out as a beta version, see what works where it doesn't work, and then improve as we go. And, and that model won't work in the car, right? So if you bring out a new f function, you have to make sure up front that it's going to be safe, that you're not going to inadvertently create um, a behavior of a car that creates dangerous situations. And so just this, um, this built-in requirement to make it safe will, will sort of temper the speed a bit with which we see the innovations come in um, beyond the infotainment side, so more on the, um, on the functional side of uh, LiDAR sensors, automation, and so on. Yeah, and, and John, if you don't mind adding yeah, to that. Sure. Uh, yeah, not a problem. Uh, I mean, with Alexa, um, our focus is to provide kind of a, a simple and delightful interaction model with the, with the user. Um, and we believe that voice is well positioned to, to be um, a very kind of complementary interface for that human and machine interaction that you have in the vehicle. Um, our focus is to keep the driver's eyes on the road when they're driving. So we want to make all of those voice interactions kind of simple and natural, right? So if I'm driving, uh, as I said, if I'm cold, I can easily ask Alexa to uh, adjust the temperature in the vehicle. If I want to access digital media, I don't have to go to the infotainment system. I can say, uh, uh, Alexa, uh, play the Beatles on Spotify, and she brings it up automatically. So the cognitive load for the driver is focused on driving. Um, I think when we look downstream, when we get to the world of autonomy, that'll open up a, a whole new set of experiences where we can get much deeper interaction with the, the passengers in the vehicle at that point. You do realize everyone watching at home now has Beatles playing on their Alexa, <laughs> right? Okay, just, uh, just making sure. Uh, and Alex, yeah. I wanted to follow up on that is, you know, a question I get a lot is, we have this huge display uh, right in front of the you know, driver and the passenger, and the question is, oh, is it distracting? So if you think of most cars these days, without any displays, you know, just all your analog dials, when people are driving, what do they typically do? Although it's illegal, they pick up their cell phone, right? They usually have a Google Maps or an Apple Maps in the background, and they're you know, picking up and trying to figure out where they go. What could be more distracting than that? And so you know, from our point of view is we have this huge display, but it is very close to your eye level. And so when you look at it, you have the, you know, your entire vision of the road, and just right underneath it, you will have the ability to get all the information you want without having to look down. And so I think, um, like my colleagues have mentioned, we're at a point where technology, using the, in the right way, can actually help minimize driver distraction. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. I was I was staring at the screen <laughs> on the, the car. Uh, now there's another thing that you guys are bringing to the market that I absolutely love. It's a different way. It's not a way to touch or it's not a way to talk. It's a different way to interact with your screen and with your car, which is with gesture controls. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about that because that's one of my most favorite features in sure. Byton. Mm -hmm. So and I'm really excited about just. Tell everybody more so what gesture controls are and, and, and why they're such a great way to interact with your tech inside your car. Well, first and foremost, you know, everything will be accessible uh, via touch. We'll also have voice. And the third option is, is the gestures. And what's great about gestures, you have the ability to, to quickly do something, a shortcut. Sometimes, you know, if you have to say something, it might take a while for it to recognize. If you want to touch and you have to go through certain screens, the ability of gestures is to allow you to quickly get to something. Um, and again, you know, it depends on the driver will have the ability to customize what type of gesture features you want, but it's just a, another way to quickly get to the feature you want Yeah. And in such a basic way to communicate, right? I mean, we were just in Shanghai, right? And I don't speak Chinese, and that's a lot of times I had to use gesture controls with other people for the, some basic communication, yeah. right? So this is a, a, a something that also hasn't been available before that, uh, and technology is catching up because, you know, tell us a little bit how it works in terms of just tech, mm -hmm. um, because you guys involve cameras and, you know, small. Well, absolutely. I mean, we have a lot of different cameras in the car. 
Um, we have your regular RGB cameras that are for you know teleconferencing. So you know in a safe scenario, whether you know you're parked or if you're in autonomous driving, you can actually have a teleconferencing call. And so you know cameras are are shown in and in, in pointed right at you. We also have gesture sensors, and so that you know will detect your hand movements. Other things we'll have is for um, autonomous driving, like driver monitoring cameras and um, and other things to to help. So there's a lot of technology. Um, that is in, in our production vehicle. Yeah. Um, let's, let's talk about other parts of the user experience that I don't think people talk much about, but beyond you know, interacting with the tech in your car, there's also buying experience. There is also an experience when something goes wrong with a car and you have to go and take it for service. And there's even you know, lease returns or selling your car. That is still part of the user experience. And I know, Jay, you've, you've been involved with, with projects like that. Tell me a little bit about what can be improved yeah. at the, you know, the dealership or the showroom that, you know, because what's the point of having a great user experience in a yeah. car if I'm not going to buy it because it's bad at the showroom, right? Oh yeah, oh, yeah. I, I think it's a um, great question and one of the things I think that has been missed for a long, long time until uh, companies like Tesla came in. So as all of us know today, we do take our cars to dealerships or service center for service. Many times, um, it's extremely annoying when they, fundamental things they miss, because I've been there for like half a dozen times, they still ask my name and phone number and email, right? So you know, in today's world, it's, uh, it's, it's a crime to you know, some of these things. So um, how things should be is your experience from in-car to outside the car, anything that you do, to interact related to your car should carry forward. Mm -hmm. Being the vehicle app where you can change the settings of your car, set up your preferences, everything from your voice to music preferences and everything. And your preferences in terms of services, uh, things have to be proactive. Using AI for voice recognition and prediction and all of those um, are not being effectively used. So what we are doing at a very high level at uh, Techion for the future is Building a cloud platform that brings a manufacturer, doesn't matter which automotive manufacturer it is, a manufacturer, a retailer, doesn't matter whether the manufacturer runs their own retail store or if it's a dealership or a franchisee dealership, and a consumer together in a seamless single platform. I don't think it exists today because it's, today's ecosystem, except for a few areas, is broken big time because the customer's interaction with their OEM or with their dealer is broken. And all of us know the experience is completely inconsistent. It depends on which dealership, the same brand, you could go to one city or even next door to another, you'll get a completely different experience. So it's all heavily people dependent, tools are fragmented, so that's what I think has to change and we are trying to change to, to build that seamless platform so that your experience is consistent. In car, outside the car, online, wherever you go, in the app, the experience becomes like one. So that's kind of what we're doing. Yeah, and, uh, and I know, Jeff, uh, did you want to say something? Um, so just to add to that, yeah. I think um, I think that is an important point. The experience can improve further, of course, if, um, if you have some deep knowledge of what is going on in the car through all the sensor data, and you even go into a predictive maintenance mode, right? So that's something that an uh, automotive cloud, like also you know, you're building one, Bosch has one as well, of course, um, can provide by looking at the sensor data and um, scheduling ahead of time a needed repair and, and maybe even informing the dealership of repair parts that they need so it becomes seamless. Right, and, and, and we're talking about proactive user experience because I think the, the, the basic notion is that we have to initiate our interaction with technology. We're really we're moving to the point where technology is going to initiate interaction with us. I mean, we've all seen the check engine sign, right? And I heard, hate mentioning engines at an electric car booth, but that's the most frustrating thing because one, what the hell does this mean? Mm -hmm. Two, what do I need to do about it? And who do I call, right? Uh, what you're talking about, Jane, and I think you, you, you were resonating that, is uh, our cars in the future should say, hey, listen, your tire pressure is low. Um, you're okay for now because the leak is not that bad, but there's a tire shop down the street, you already have an account with them and I scheduled an appointment for you. In about 15 minutes, they'll be waiting for you. This will deter you by 20 yeah. minutes. So here, let's call your mom and tell you, you know, her to not to put those eggs to boil just yet, right? Yeah. Um, talk a little bit more and, and, and you guys feel free to jump in. I think 
Uh, what, what will this mean to the customers? Uh, are they ready for it? And, and how fast we need to start moving with it? Will it give the, the, the car companies uh, an advantage over the ones that are not doing it? I think customers are ready for it because I mean, I, I've heard so many people complaining that today they're um, experience in everything else, right? Of course, using an Alexa, using an iPhone, using an Android device um, has really raised the bar. Um, so customers are wanting it, and like I said, um, the technology is available. I don't think it's applied. It's not seamless. It's not consistent. And you're absolutely right. Um, when when someone is driving and a check engine light comes up, I, I think. Right around the time the light comes up, the information should have been already passed to the OEM, to the closest service centers. Their preferred service center pop-up should come up in their console to say, you know, do you want to, it looks like your engine light is on, and here, is my, here might be the problem. And do, when do you want to schedule your appointment at your preferred service center? And do you want to change it, or do you want us to go ahead and schedule? So once you schedule it, then it becomes automatic for you next time when something like this happens, the system predicts and starts scheduling an appointment for you. So making that experience really simple and seamless, and also transparency doesn't exist today, so providing more transparency on what exactly might be the problem with your car. That way customers feel really comfortable, and customers are really expecting, and I know there is demand for us. And yeah. I think it can go beyond that as well. So the engine light is one example, but as we see more autonomous functions come in, the tar car takeover responsibility for driving maneuvers, that's on the road today, right? The lane keeping, the, the distance keeping, and so on. And if you're surprised as a driver by something the car does, you know, you have a nice display like the one behind us here, um, wouldn't that be a good opportunity to explain to the driver why did the car just do something, right? So. Why did it uh, jerk the steering wheel? Why did it uh, sound an alarm? And sort of quickly convey what the situation is, that there is someone passing you and you can't change lanes right now, right? So things like that. Uh, and, and so the question is really, is this something that customers are literally going to demand in their next car? So I think it's less about demand, but it's about using technology and allowing trust to build with the customer base. Um, an example is, you know, I think you, know, you mentioned with the ADAS features and also Thomas driving, customers have to learn to trust the car, the technology. And we have to make it in a way where we are, in a smart way, educating them as we show them the technology. If you do everything blind behind the curtain, you're never going to get that trust level. And so, you know, I think the key is in the user interface, how do we provide just enough information so that the occupants in the car are aware of what's going on, but not too much to um, distort or cloud um, you know, their experience. And so I think there's a, it's a very um, difficult point to get to, but I would actually say you know, more information, especially when you're trying to push new technologies on them, is, is a necess necessity. Okay, no, I totally agree. And um, something that Jay just touched on a few minutes ago, that a lot of times our good user experience doesn't necessarily even come from a particular experience, it comes from what we already know, right? So for example, if I have Alexa at home, uh, and I'm already used to interacting with Alexa, and even her voice, right? I'm just used to her voice, then to me interacting with her now that it's going to be in my car, like it's going to be in Byton, becomes a, sm you know, a very smooth transition, and therefore a better user experience. So uh, John, talk a little bit more about like how, how is me leaving the, my home and, and getting into my car, how that transition is going to be smooth where I'm really familiar with what I already know, even if it's my first time with Alexa in my car. Yeah, so we've made uh, great inroads over the last few years in, in the smart home space where you can use Alexa to interact with your home, to turn lights on, adjust the temperature, monitor your security system. Right? We view the vehicle as just another environment where you can have that same similar experience and the transition gets really interesting as well. Over time, we'll see that you know, every morning at 7.30 a.m., you're, you're leaving the home and going to the car. Well, we, with the connectivity that's now available, uh, either um, using voice commands or automatically, we can proactively start to precondition the vehicle. If it's cold outside, we'll start the car, warm it to a, a preset uh, temperature, even open your garage door. As you leave the, your, your vicinity, we use geofencing to automatically um, decondition your home. Lower the lights, lower the temperatures, lock the home, enable the security system. Uh, we'll do this in a way, um, as, um, as mentioned, where we want it to be subtle, we want to provide visibility and information back to the customer using voice, um, 
but we want to make sure that those key systems are kind of taken care of. So that, that transition from the home to the car uh, is, a, is a really important use case for us, as well as the transition back, as you can imagine, coming back home, making sure the home is preconditioned for your arrival uh, when you return. I think it goes again beyond that as well, right? So what do you do when you reach the destination? You want to park your car somewhere. Um, so I think at this point, uh, sort of the notion of ecosystems and a platform where developers can join in and build apps on top of all the sensor data that the car collects uh, is important. But so for example, Bosch uh, uh, launched a, a parking aid, a, a community-based parking solution a while back, which will be rolled out now in, in 20 cities in this year. And it, it uses the ultrasound sensors that cars you have as you drive past um, sort of open parking spots on the side of the street collects that in the cloud, and if you know, um, your navigation system knows where you're going, and you sign up to the service, it will tell you exactly where there's street parking available nearby, for yeah. example. Yeah, it, just, it, you know. Enabling that kind of uh, platform services is super important, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that's one of the things that Alexa does as well. With uh, We have what we call yeah. the Alexa Skills Kit. I think we have 50,000 or more third-party skills that have been built to kind yes. of extend the Alexa experience, yes. and we've got uh, you know, parking purchasing, gas purchasing, a lot of in-vehicle services that are now starting to emerge. So, yeah. Yeah. And I think this is going to be the key going forward. We need partnerships, right? This is not something companies can go alone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We need these ecosystems that enable partners to come together, build on a platform, and provide sort of the experience that, that we've been talking about here. And so let's talk about platforms, right? Because right now, you know, it's, it's in the early stages. We're trying to figure out what is the operating systems for the car needs to be, what the platform is. Uh, uh, tell me a little bit uh, about wh where you see the future of platforms. Is it going to be, you know, we're just going to have Mac and Windows again in our cars? Do you think someone will take leadership? Or there needs to be a leadership in, in, in the role of creating a platform? Because, you know, it's a little bit beyond just having a, a cell phone, right? Like you mentioned, you know, the brain of, of our Alexa and our, our platforms need to come with us because it needs to think for us. It needs to look for parking spaces, like Halka said just now. Uh, what do you guys think that the, the, the future of a platform is? And Jeff, I kind of want to start with you guys because you're developing one right now. Yeah. Uh, uh, talk a little bit about that and talk about it a little bit. Where do you think it's going to be in about three to five years? Okay. Well, one thing is you still have your classic um, car, right? And so, you know, when we're selecting operating systems, you need something that is secure, um, that is, you know, a, a, a true, you know, operating system that is real time and that is, you know, that is fault tolerant. Um, but the other side is you have, you know, it's more the entertainment, the ecosystem, and a lot of, um, you know, content these days is the app based. And so what we have is we selected um, a QNX for our instrument cluster operating system, and the rest is more Android based. And so, you know, we're at this, you know, time where we have to kind of mix um, consumer electronics and automotive, classic automotive, right? The vision of the future is you have um, something that is more blended. Right now, we actually have to pick two different ones, run it on a hypervisor. In the future, if there was one that's a little bit more seamless, uh, I think that, that could be a potential platform in the future. Whether you know, OEMs build that, or a tier ones build that, or you know, we still partner with third parties. Yeah. yeah. yeah from um, an Alexa perspective, we think of it as in terms of services that we provide. Uh, we're platform agnostic and open. We support QNX, Android, various versions of Linux as well in terms of our in-vehicle auto SDK that we've deployed. Um, but the services are agnostic, regardless of what platform will support and run on any of the platforms. Yeah, and, and, and Jay, I'm, I'm not going to let you sit this one out. I mean, <laughs> Tesla has always been a, a pioneer in yeah. that. And, you know, uh, and, you know, talking about Tesla, they, they've now been trying to develop as many things as possible in-house, uh, kind of following Apple's maybe uh, um, uh, philosophy. But uh, do you think that platforms should be developed, you know, in-house by each manufacturer for their own brand, or do you think there should be a separate sort of a third-party provider? Um, maybe I'm looking at Bosch even yeah. <laughs> uh, to 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 provide it for everybody because essentially we're all people. We all want to have the same experience no matter yeah, what car we exactly. buy. T tell me a little bit yeah, about that. I think that's a Trillion dollar question. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let me answer this two, two ways. Uh, one, yeah, platform and ecosystem is critical and it's going to be a differentiator um, in terms of who's going to um, do well um, in the industry. 
And starting from, I want to just give a quick analogy for people. Obvious one is the Apple, right? So when Apple built the iPhone, um, the, or uh, even the iPod, the biggest thing I think that changed the adoption quick is the I iTunes. So bringing, uh, building a backbone infrastructure and also an ecosystem for users to go do what they want, not just only in the iPod or in the iPhone, but on their PC, on their laptops, and whichever device they're using, I think that's the differentiator. So Tesla is going in that direction, of course, building their ecosystem. Um, I think there is, the, both of these can coexist because there are quite a few operating systems out there from iOS to Android, and there are, some are closed and some are very open. I think there is definitely potential for open ecosystems like Android um, primarily. Um, as long as um, there is a consistency in terms of uh, and collaboration between the manufacturers, both um, the automotive OEM manufacturers and also the providers of all the services and tools, mm -hmm. I think coming together and building that platform, you're absolutely right. As a consumer, for me, the more consistency I can get in my experience, irrespective of what brand vehicle I use, it's going to be better for me. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to expect that consistency. Um, so uh, again, in my view, I don't have a kind of a single answer that who's going to win. There's examples of both being successful. I think both will coexist, but definitely is going to be a differentiator. I think every company that builds an uh, automotive user experience has to focus and put in a lot of effort building that ecosystem and platform. Um, super critical. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I think we have to look at this um, from the perspective of two worlds there. There's the, um, the infotainment world that will be open to the competition that you say, and then we have the safety world where um, all the safety functions of a car happen, right? How does braking work? How does steering work? How do I make sense of the world around me and react to it? Yeah. And we see this, um, this line blurring a bit, right? So we have now f firmware over the air, features in cars that also update the control units on the safety side. And um, with that comes a lot of sort of caution and responsibility, yeah. and we'll see a lot of sort of, sort of more more um, focus there on, on testing and on validation that it works before rolling it out. Then on the entertainment side, it's okay if I mis um, uh, recognize a, a command of a user once in a while, right? But if my safety system misrecognizes a pedal uh, signal, that's it's fatal possibly. <clears throat> And, and I think, so in this sense, cybersecurity will be also a huge issue. Um, how do we secure even the entertainment side um, much better than we do today in our living rooms against hacker attacks? Because these will be very attractive targets for hackers to, to target, making sure that um, the car is safe uh, from, from cyber attacks. Right? It's funny you mention that because we have a panel tomorrow right here about uh, car security. And, and right. we'll, 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 we'll talk about it in more details. But you know, security is part of a user experience, obviously. If yep. you can't have a good user experience if your credit card is in the hands of, you know, uh, a, a prince somewhere in another country, right? Uh, so what, what do you think are the most important things that right now we need to worry about right now as we're developing this feature? So let me give you an example. So one of the reasons I love Byton's innovation is that much like with an iPhone, when you approach the car, it will recognize your face. Hey, oh, Alex, welcome back. I know your temperature that you want to be set. I know which you know iTunes a uh, 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 song I want uh, you know want to be played. And 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 for example, if uh, you know my girlfriend comes back in another from the other side and oh she likes this type of setting for herself and everything. Now that obviously uses uh, a facial recognition, but with that comes the responsibility of making sure that only my car knows what I like and not everybody else in the world, right? Yeah. Uh, talk about that, and actually this question is really for the rest of you guys. What responsibilities, what, what actions do we need to take right now to make sure that these awesome features we're talking about <laughs> are not going to be a problem as far as uh, uh, security is concerned? And so you're touching um, privacy as well, right? I um, am. How does, um, how does a car deal with the fact that it's connected and what information about me is in the cloud? What information does Amazon or Google or Apple have it about me? It right? knows too much. And um, so I think this is a very active field of discussion right now. We see the Europeans um, went marching forward with the GDPR, which um, I observe sort of is taking on a, a more global role than they maybe anticipated originally, but it's setting out sort of to be a standard um, that everyone is working towards um, complying with. And it sets some ground rules about how to deal with um, people's um, personal data. Transparency is the key. You have to give people the choice of what they want to upload and make them aware of it. 
if they want the service and they opt in, by all means, do it. Right? Yeah. And I think you hit on uh, multi-factor authentication, right? When yeah. you approach the car, uh, we want to use video, we want to use voice, uh, we want to use the key fob, we want to use your mobile phone, right? Multiple ways that we can authenticate that yeah. you're the person that should be interacting with the car. And like, okay. like Don mentioned, we will have multi, um, multiple ways to authenticate. With key fob, facial recognition, maybe just even a pin. Um, but one key element that is very critical is to allow the um, user to opt into these, right? They will have the option um, to access um, the vehicle in, in multiple different ways, but also to access their data or, or to even not access their data, right? And that's the key is to build that user trust, you have to allow, give them the opportunity to make that selection, that decision. And so we'll, we'll be doing that as well. Okay, and, and also uh, authentication can happen with your voice, for example, right? This is something that is recognizable and unique. Yeah. T today with, uh, with Alexa, we use voice to personalize the experience, right? That's kind of been our, our first use of voice is to provide you a personalized experience. We're still relying on more traditional ways to authenticate, but you could envision as the technology evolves, sometime in the future we could, we could go down that route. Um, with regard to right to be forgotten, uh, that's, that's super important to us is the, the trust relationship that we have with the customer. Uh, so while Alexa's always learning from your interactions, we're also very transparent. You can go into the Alexa system, you can see all your interactions with the system, and you can choose to you know, clear your history if you'd like as well. So I think providing that transparency and establishing trust with the customer is very important. And giving customer the control of what and how your information, your privacy is being controlled by the tech that you're, uh, you know, interacting with. Um, okay, yeah. so now let's talk about a little bit about the uh, the, the, the future, right? Because uh, it, it just like you said, it's exciting times that we're living in right now. But uh, with all the challenges that we have, and of course we can dream about a lot of amazing things. Um, and uh, where do you think is uh, uh, the biggest demand for the user experience? What type of features do you think that that users will demand? Is it still going to, con you know, within the entertainment and within a comfort uh, zone of, of the customers? Or is it going to venture out and more complicated things like, you know, privacy and security and so forth? Mm -hmm. I can jump in on this one. Um, I think it's about all of that because it's about your life outside of the car and extending at that when you enter the car. And so if you have all that time back, you know, whether you're doing work, you know, teleconferencing, maybe it's an email, maybe you just want to go to Amazon and buy something, maybe you just want to watch you know, a video or some content, it's about all of that. Um, and especially because we, we, were, we will be in a world of autonomous driving, but also the other side is um, for EVs, it's about charging. And as technology progresses, the charge times go down. So we'll at, at launch have the ability to charge up to 80% of our car within 30 minutes. And that, in time, will keep decreasing. So instead of going to the gas station, pumping, going in, maybe you know, grabbing a cup of coffee or something else, you'll be in a charge station for 10, 20 minutes. That is all time that you can be spent doing something. And so, again, it's less about anything specific, but it's about your life outside of the car. We need to figure out how to extend that while, while you are in the car. It's interesting you mentioned that because, I mean, obviously self-driving technology, autonomous driving is something that's been a hot topic. And even though we had a pretty tough year so yep. far, yep. Mm -hmm. it is coming sooner or later. It will be most likely first in the uh, uh, you know, ride-sharing services and everything. So do you think the user experience has to uh, shift from maybe um, you know, a essential experience for the driver as far as where you go and how you get there and so forth to how we continue our lives in our vehicle pods, essentially, what they're probably going to be at some point, um, and continue on with other things that maybe are not related to driving at all uh, in many different sense of the world. Where do you see this going? Where do you think this, and, and how fast do you think we'll get there? Well, I think the key point is we'll have the ability to do with uh, over there software updates. And at launch, since we are, our target is end of 2019, it, it is still a driver-centric world. And so the UI, the experience is going to be focused on driver-centric with you know, acknowledgement of all the other users. But as the shift happens with autonomous driving, we will also change uh, or, or evolve our, our UI concept. And so that's the key is you have to address both worlds and, and do so in a smart way um, allows us to, to bridge to the future. Yeah. I think yeah. it'll also be in, uh, 
question of where you do this. So the different cultures all have different expectations on how systems support them. I think the one common thing is it will be very individual, so that the passenger will have a different expectation than the driver will have. Um, sort of different speeds of adoption in different parts of the world. Um, different mobility patterns, right? So not everyone is around the world is sitting in traffic jam uh, one, one hour in the morning, where you may have you know, different needs than if you're, if you're going on vacation over land or so, right? Okay. And I think um, the way we, we think about it, we, we can't wait for autonomy to come. It really makes the vehicle um, either a, a living room or a, an office, a place of work. And we want to provide those kinds of experiences seamlessly to not just the driver. I, I agree with uh, Jeff's comments earlier that it, most of our experiences today typically focus on the driver. But you've got passengers in the vehicle. You could be watching video in the, in the rear seat. You could have multiple phone conversations going on in the vehicle. How do we use the technologies, the emerging technologies, to provide that delightful experience for the customer? So essentially, there will be no driver at some point, right? The user experience will be targeted to uh, passengers, where, which, which all of us are going to be at some point. Um, all right, well, so we're running out of time, but let me just pose this last question to all of you guys, and I kind of want to hear from, from, from everyone. You know, uh, things are moving pretty fast right now. Uh, if, if you were to pick one uh, most essential thing that will differentiate uh, a brand and will, you know, basically will either give it life or death, uh, as far as user experience feature is concerned, um, what would it be within the next three, year, uh, three years? What would be that one thing that a customer will absolutely 100% demand from the car manufacturers, and if you don't have it, you might just be out of the game? Mm -hmm. Alexa, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> Uh, well, explain why. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the, um, the kind of seamless interaction. You know, uh, obviously, I'm, I'm, I have a biased opinion based on uh, being on the Alexa Amazon team. Um, but we believe that seamless interaction where you can naturally interact with the vehicle is going to be a critical feature. You look at uh, kind of traditional legacy voice experiences in the vehicles. They've been very problematic, rated poorly by customers as part of the JD Power research that's gone on for years. We think that interaction model is going to be critical, and it will be a critical uh, desire from the customer as well. And you know who will agree with you is Elon Musk, right? I mean, he just recently said that the reason all of these features are kind of disappearing from the, you know, some of the future Teslas, uh, the screens are getting smaller because there's just maybe not as much interaction where you have to do with your fingers. Absolutely. It will basically be with your voice. And I believe he will. He said that they're very committed to essentially uh, wiping out all need of interacting with, with touch screens. Um, all right. So uh, Jeff is making me say this, but it has to be the <laughs> Bosch Automotive Cloud, of course, right? Um, in the sense that it will provide additional experiences and services um, to drivers that they will expect, right? So I mentioned the parking part. Um, there's going to be a whole lot of things that we can make available um, based on um, the sensors that cars experience and, and, or see the world with. Um, Friction-based maps, for example, so all the sensor-based maps, right? Um, curve warners that tell you that you're going too fast into a corner. So a lot of um, directly experienceable features that improve safety for the driver that they will appreciate having. Jeff? So I think it's about creating an intuitive user experience. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, I think we've all, you know, we probably all travel a lot. And every time we go somewhere, I usually get a rental car. I mean, sometimes do Uber, sometimes Lyft. A lot of times I get in the rental car and I'm trying to figure out, okay, how do I turn on the navigation? How do I turn this on? How do I see, adjust my seats? It's not always intuitive. And so one thing where we're trying very hard to do at Biden is make the experience intuitive so folks, when they get in, it's almost self-explanatory. And I think that is going to be the critical piece in the future that you have to, all the OEMs will have to think about the user. And it's not because, well, we've always done it this way. Users will figure it out. We have to think about the users in mind. And I think that will be a key differentiator, and that's something we're really focused on at Byton. Yeah, the, I think the key differentiator is going to be two very related things. Um, so one is the seamless experience, I think, that John mentioned. Uh, definitely users are going to expect that. But the ecosystem, I think, is going to be, make the bigger difference because that's what is going to support it. Um, I think if you don't provide the ecosystem, I'm, I'm pretty sure that a lot of companies will come up with cool touch screens, with gestures, with voice. But what's going to differentiate is who builds the best ecosystem for the customers to get that seamless experience um, throughout, in car, outside car, online, whatever they interact with the brand, it should be the same experience. 
Excellent. You know, actually, I lied. I have one more question. Uh, because, I mean, you guys are all working on, on a very exciting projects in your companies and everything. Uh, why don't you tell us about what's the next big thing that you're working on, something that you're really excited about, because all of the projects, you, pro, you know, projects and products you're working on is something that we'll probably be waiting for and be excited about. It. Tell us what is it that, that, that we should be excited about. Uh, about as far as your products are concerned. A little bit of a self-plug, I guess. We, we have something in Amazon we call our day one uh, mentality, that it's always day one. I think for uh, automotive, it really still is day one for us in terms of really understanding what the customer wants and needs. Um, I think we're putting, we're, all of us here are putting down what I would call table stakes for the next generation of um, capabilities and services that we'll provide uh, to the customer. Um, it, you know, so I think you, you look at uh, being kind of more aware, more uh, personalized, uh, more proactive. I think those are going to be some of the, the key areas that we develop our, our respective technologies in. Excellent. Yeah, I think I, I would say the, the integration of these different um, uh, application areas of mobility, right? So you have, we mentioned the home, integrating that with your driving experience with uh, when you arrive, what happens there. Um, when you're at the office, how do you sort of plan the next stage of mobility? Um, so this, this whole ecosystem around this, you know, when do you use a scooter, when do you d walk, when do you drive? Um, mapping all these things into a unique experience and, and saving time and, and efficiency comfort for the user. Right? And you mentioned parking and we're in, we're in San Francisco, so I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for that one it's for out. sure. It's absolutely, out, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> Jeff? So I think we stated at Byton, you know, this concept car is 80, 85% production intent. And so what we're really doing is evolving that concept for production car uh, in the next year. And so um, I think we're going to, you know, if you love the concept now, I think the production car is going to be even better. So we need to get back to work so Alec can buy his first uh, Byton car Absolutely. soon. Absolutely. And I will. Jay? Yeah. So we, as I mentioned earlier, we are building a platform to bring together uh, auto manufacturer, a retailer, and a consumer together in one simple cloud platform. So what that means is we are building pretty much the a data lake or a big data platform on the cloud, and all the necessary plugins for IoT, IoT doesn't, it can be a car, it can be a display in an automotive dealership. If you're walking in just across a display within an automotive retail center, the display should know who you are as a customer what type of vehicles you have, what is your preference. So that seamless experience comes together. So that's what we are trying to um, deliver to the market. Excellent, I, I, I'm excited about all of this. And, 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 and first of all, thank you all for, for being here and, and having this uh, exciting discussion. Uh, we'll be back here tomorrow discussing autom automotive security, which we already touched on. So we got a, what a, a great start. If you haven't checked out the prototype behind us, I strongly recommend. I think this is my fifth time with a car. Uh, I'm surprised you guys are not making me make lease payments on it. It's absolutely amazing. So thank you so much for all of you guys. And thank you for, to you gentlemen for being here. For, thank you for your time. Great, thank you. All right, see you guys tomorrow. Thank you.